Okay, so we're going to do something a little different today. I have my lovely girlfriend with me, and she's going to be learning about what I've been researching. So, sort of a talking about and listening about. Hello. Okay, so, ready? you ready for this? I guess so. Okay, here we go. Today I'm talking about one of my favorite morbid curiosities, medieval surgery. Hmm. Now, I know I've told you some of this already, but hopefully uh, there's a lot you didn't quite know. So let me just set up some history. So in the early Middle Ages, monks or nuns were often your go-to surgeons. They had all these medical texts, which were uh, usually in Arabic, and they were the ones who could translate it. So they'd be the ones fixing you up. But in 1215, the Pope said they couldn't do this anymore. So surgery falls onto the farmers and other laborers. The farmers? Yes. From the religious types. Like, well, like the peasants, because the, the Pope said, no more, none of this in religion anymore. So, now so it's just laborers doing it now. They were just like, we're not going to worry about this anymore. You guys take care of it. Yeah, essentially, I guess. So th those are the monks. Those are the guys. You know, they used to do it, but they're, they're not doing it anymore. So now it's farmers. And as you can tell by the picture, it's kind of like, well, if, if you can cut up meat, you can, you can, do, body. You can do amputations. So that's, that's kind of what they thought. I mean, maybe to an extent, you know, you have some some idea of the anatomy and the way, you know, blood works or I don't know what you need to eat. I don't think they did. They're just like... So this brings us to, uh, if you've ever kind of looked into medieval surgery, it brings us to barber surgeons. So just a fun fact, um, that's where the barber pole originates from. See, the white is supposed to be bandages. The red is supposed to be blood. So it's a medical symbol, like and, the snake. And the bar is actually supposed to symbolize the thing they made people hold onto uh, to make their veins pop out so they could get blood from them. It's weird that they need a bar for that. Oh. Just it, punch your fist. It makes your veins pop out more. Okay, so they were usually just doing like teeth pulling and amputations, though, because surgery at the time was viewed as a lowly profession. Physicians wanted nothing to do with it. So a lot of the really invasive stuff was being done by uneducated people. Not that anyone really knew too much about surgery at the time, because germ theory isn't going to gain popularity until 1890. Hmm. You want to take a guess of what the current theory was at the time? Um, I have no idea. It's called miasma theory. So th <laughs> this is where you get things like the plague doctor. Everything comes Ooh. from bad air, because they, they had like the little potpourri at the end of the nose, because they thought that would like kill whatever spreads diseases. They look like badasses. It was to the point where some suspected you'd become obese just by inhaling food odors. Huh. I hope not. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, you know, science isn't great. Um, you also have this long-standing belief in laudable pus, which I, I've told you about. Now, what does that mean? So, laudable pus was the idea that pus was meant... Uh, it meant good and healthy tissue. So they would essentially encourage infections. They noticed that living tissue produced pus and necrotizing tissue didn't because dead tissue is not going to produce anything, obviously. Which is obviously a good sign. But, you know. So they thought wounds needed pus. And this belief gets far worse before it gets better. See, hospital gangrene was a serious issue before antiseptic techniques. Patients infected would see their skin necrotizing, turning black at a rate of a half an inch or more an hour. Jesus, that's like the right that <laughs> kelp grows. They could literally sit there and watch their skin start disintegrating. It's like uh, evil dead. And you just have to chop it off before it reaches you and you turn evil. I'm sure they did, but the infection remained and it would just keep going up higher and higher. There goes the torso. The mortality rate for hospital gangrene was... 46%. That's how bad it was. And are these like mostly like soldiers or just like your average person who gets a horrible infection? It was probably at its most notable uh, during wars, like yeah. uh, American Revolution and you stuff. Get a leg Civil War. Off or something or some deep wound. Uh, so the other serious issue with medieval surgery was pain. Now, uh, modern anesthetic wasn't widely used until the 1800s. There was a powerful and deba debatedly commonplace anesthetic called Duale, but it was risky to use and it was easy to overdose and die from. Isn't that a holiday? <laughs> Should be. But even with alcohol and opiates available, surgeons believed patients needed to stay awake and alert during the operations. So they just restrained them to keep them from squirming Ugh. and hopefully gave them something to bite down on. 
Jesus. Okay, so you ready to get into the the, the surgeries? I suppose. Careful with that. Okay. First thing we're going to start with is called cataract couching. Okay. Uh, um, it comes from uh, coucher. Coucher? I don't know. It's French. But I'm going to call it couching. Couché. Cataract couching. Okay, now this technique isn't just in the medieval times. This was recorded as far back as 800 BC, but it stayed for a long time. The patient was seated and restrained by an assistant, and the surgeon would use a knife to slice into the eye. Ugh, God. Then, with a needle, would push the opaque lens inferiorly downward. Once the patient could have some semblance of sight, they would stop, and again, this is the needing to be awake and alert thing. So they, they need to be awake and alert to be like, oh, I'm seeing some shapes and colors. Okay, we've got, we've got to Wait, stop. What is the surgery for? Is it like corrective surgery? Like for your sight? Or is it for like a glaucoma? Or? Well, they're essentially blind at this point. So, the, the, so their eyes are a lost cause either way. The lens, yeah, the lens is like so opaque. You can't see through it. They're like, we just got to get this down. Like cataracts. It is cataracts. Oh, okay. This is, this is the surgery for cataracts oh, in medieval times. Okay. Gotta wonder what it feels like. So the outcomes were usually poor, obviously. If it was successful, since they no longer had a lens, uh, they'd need some really serious corrective lenses. Right. But often, the majority would be permanently blind. Jesus. Now, now here's the thing, though. Are these old people or are these, like, young people? Usually, like, 65. Okay. Seems to be the, the age. But Probably didn't live much longer after that at that time anyways. The really surprising thing with cataract couching is that it's still done today. Wait. <laughs> but with anesthetic. No. Um, I don't know about that. I don't know about the anesthetic, but I know it's still being done today. Jeez. So there, there are people in parts of the world... Uh, uh, namely one study from Mali in West Africa where they're unaware of any better alternative. And would you guess what the results are? I'll tell you, they're just as poor. Like half the people go blind? 70% of the patients come out blind. Ugh. <laughs> I think I'd rather just get my cataracts. Okay. Now here's, a, here's one for the kids. Next one, hemorrhoids. Mmm. Told you a little about this. Okay, so I don't know how to pronounce his name, but we're gonna call him uh, Saint Fiat. Spell okay. spell. I don't I don't know. Saint Fiat. Yeah, He's the patron saint of gardeners. But after a particularly long day of gardening, he developed a severe case of prolapsed hemorrhoids. As you normally do. As you normally do. So seeking a solution, he sat on a stone and prayed for help. Well, his prayers were answered as the stone he sat on cured his hemorrhoids. People from all over journeyed to sit on his holy stone to cure their own hemorrhoids. Doctors would actually suggest this as a treatment. Go sit on a rock. And thus, Saint Fiat, I forgot where you're pronouncing his name. Saint Face, because it looks like face to me. Saint Face also became the patron saint of hemorrhoids. Aww. That's sweet of him. <laughs> now, for your average hemorrhoid sufferer in the Middle Ages, there were two cures. Uh, the first was simply ripping the hemorrhoid off, Ugh. for which Hippocrates suggested the physician have some good sharp fingernails for. So you grow your fingernails out beforehand. If you're the one dealing with hemorrhoids, you probably should. Okay, so sort of like opposite of lesbian culture. Sure. Um, or, this is a That's good picture a for picture. it, or they would take an iron poker and stick it in the fire, wait till it got red hot, and then insert oh. it into the rectum. Why does it have to be hot? They're like cauterizing it? They are cauterizing it. Wouldn't that just like cauterize your whole asshole shit? Well, the... I mean, so envision if you didn't have a prolapsed, right? So it's inside the rectum. Okay. They're going to shove it all the way in. Wouldn't that just, like, yeah, wouldn't that just, like, destroy Uranus? I'm like, okay, no more using that anymore. It probably would, but, um... Oops, destroyed Uranus. It seems a lot worse than the actual uh, ailment. Yeah. I think hemorrhoids are livable. Um, now here's a fun one. Arrowhead removal. Ooh, that's a nice device. So uh, this actually has some kind of tie-in with Shakespeare because uh, King Henry is in Shakespeare, and this is a, a t King Henry V. This is a tale from when he was just 16 years old. Okay. All right. So arrows were a real problem in olden times uh, because the arrowhead would just break apart. Uh, the shaft would break apart and the arrowhead would stay lodged. Okay, like so a bullet kind of. How did they remove them? Giant. 
How did they? Well, this account comes from Henry V, as I said, when he was just 16. An arrow drove six inches into his cheek, Ooh. resting towards the back of his skull. The surgeon, mindful... This is all without anesthetic, okay? Mm-hmm. He's feeling all of this. The surgeon made probes into the wound with increasing length and width. So he's trying to dig in down this is there. This trial and error. No, he's, he's just trying to widen the hole so he can get in there. He, <sighs> they're made of wood and they're wrapped in linen. And he just probes. He's going in, trying to make that, it in there. make that hole big enough so he can get to the arrowhead. Okay. Now, when he does get to the arrowhead, he takes these special tongs. And you can see here, it's it's kind of like that. Um, probably not the actual one he used, but uh, pretty similar. He'd place into the hole of the arrowhead where the shaft used to be. So the arrowhead's okay, like this. the He's, metal piece goes yeah. in. And then he takes the screw, the screw portion, and he expands it so there's a nice firm lock. Now we can rock it back and forth to dislodge it from the bone. Okay. Once it's dislodged from the bone, you'd think that would be the end. You'd think, oh, good. Um, But they needed to keep the wound clean. So uh, Prince Henry, at this point, he has to uh, daily take those probes and clean out that wound, that six inch deep wound. The same width and everything? Every day it'll get a little smaller to try to close the wound, but he's still got to stick it in there every day to, oh to clean it. People back then must have just been like... Why don't I just die? Well, either that or they're just like really good at dealing with pain. Like, oh yeah, you know, it's part of the day. Like, just horrible torture. I don't know. All right. Uh, you ever have a tonsillitis? I had my tonsils removed, I guess. Oh, good. This is relevant for you, then. <laughs> uh, tonsillectomy. How would I know this about you? Maybe you've told me. I just forgot. I've told you. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, tonsillitis, like cataracts, hemorrhoids, and kidney stones, um, which we're going to get to, is, it's a pretty common affliction. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is pretty kind of scary that this is probably something, well, you would have experienced. Yes. Uh, the treatment for it's never been ideal. So way yeah. back, I'm talking 200 AD. This is 200 years after uh, you know Christ dies. Uh, the supported method to remove the tonsils was to use a snare. If you can see, there's like a little snare at the end right there. Okay. So it's like a metal hook that wraps around it, kind of. Yeah. Well, they, they they'd stick it in. They'd wrap it around the exposed portion of the tonsils. Right, and then pull it. And back then pull so it's it tight. Cut off the circulation, and then just kind of. Right at the, the oh. last bit to kind of just get everything It's like the way they, they used to, uh, I don't know, if you didn't have any other tools, the way c- they could remove an arm with like a piece of wire you wrap it around and you just saw. But probably easier because it's tonsils, right? I feel like I saw that in a horror movie. I think it was in The Walking Dead. Oh. But it was probably also in some horror movies. <laughs> but it looks very painful. Um, so yeah, you'd tighten around the, the protruding portion of the inflamed tonsils and cut off the circulation and then it could be severed. Okay. okay. So, But this was extremely painful. I know, because even the ones they have nowadays, you're in pain for weeks afterwards, and that's under anesthetic with painkillers and having done it in the most proper way possible. And it con- this exact procedure continued for at least 1,400 more years. So now we're well into the Middle Just Ages. Just keep your tonsils? Um, it was so painful that surgeons stated... Excuse me. This procedure is liable to resolve itself into physical combat between the surgeon and the patient. Like fighting for your life, like throwing them off of you. Like once they realize how painful it's going to be, get off. They're going to start trying to kick and punch you to get the fuck away from them. You think they would like? Okay, so you don't have any anesthetic. You'd say they. Why don't they just like knock them out? Like hit him on the head with a. Because Tony, they needed to be awake and alert. All right. (laughs) (laughs) They have to. Okay. They have to feel the pain for it to work. So. Everyone's clamoring at this point for a new a new way to deal with tonsils, uh, tonsillitis. Okay. So what do they do? In comes the tonsillotome. Ooh. Uh, the tonsillotome, or for the layman, the tonsil guillotine. See, uh, this little device could quickly and instantly chop off the protruding tonsils. So it's quicker now. And better yet, the physician could just use one hand and have no assistance, be like, snip, next... And then he can use his other hand to hold the patient down who's trying to fight him. They don't even have time. <laughs> Before they know it, it's over. That's good. Um, now, you may have been wondering this whole time, now, did they realize, like, there's a whole bunch of other tonsil in there? They're just cutting off the little bit that's sticking out? Yeah, it's like a wart at that, where it's like, you gotta get in there. 
Okay. Well, there's there's actual reason why they didn't do that. So they could get more work? They they didn't remove all of the tonsils because back then, they thought the secretions of the nose were thought to come from the brain. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and and the tonsils absorbed the excess secretion and sent it back up into the brain. Oh my god, mini brains. They do kind of look like mini brains. So they thought they were extremely important. <laughs> and they, they refused to touch the rest of it. It's pretty funny because nowadays tonsils are known as completely unimportant. Anyways, the, uh, uh, the, the, oh, the tonsil guillotine, um, mm. was much preferred because instead of having this extended torture, it was just a short burst of a like excruciating a pain. Off. Like ripping a band-aid off. And if you want to see, this is the double guillotine. So they could do both at oh, once. Shit, son. That looks fancy. Half the work, only one snip. Okay. This little gun. Now, uh, this one I mentioned to you because it was just too good to hold to myself, but uh, the tobacco smoke enemas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Originally a medical treatment pioneered by Native Americans, Okay. tobacco smoke enemas gained popularity in England in the mid-18th century. See, at the time, they were struggling, attempting to revive drowning victims, and the best theory was that the victim needed warmth and stimulation. Once they discovered tobacco in this enema thing, the solution seemed pretty obvious. Of course. It was originally <laughs> it was originally designed with the resuscitator blowing the smoke themselves. They quickly switched to the bellow design to prevent inhaling any farts. I oh my assume. god. Do you think this is where the expression blowing smoke up your ass came from? Holy crap, you're probably right. Yeah. That's probably exactly where it comes from. Hey, you're from. just blowing smoke up my ass, guy. That's not going to keep me from drowning. But the the actual reason why they had to get away from like the person blowing it uh, the smoke themselves is uh, pretty gross. See, okay. if the resuscitator accidentally inhaled instead of blue, flecks of stool could be ingested, Aww. which gave the high outbreaks, which given the high outbreaks at the time, would possibly infect them with cholera. Oh my god. And that, that would not end well for them. So anyways. There's probably no treatment for that back then, right? It wasn't good. Okay, probably just blowing more smoke up their ass. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's probably right. Something like that. Okay, so by 1780, numerous smoke enema kits were installed along the River Thames to save drowning victims. So it's like it's like a phone booth kind of. It's along the way for mm. your use. Absolutely. I mean, okay. this this was a fad of the time. The treatment quickly spread as a cure for hernias, colds, and even headaches. Oof, man, it's gotta have some like you know like a little tobacco rush. I don't know. Maybe that doesn't work that way. Some reason those Native Americans were doing it. Or it's just painful enough that they think it works, like their other procedures. Mm. Something like that. No pain, no gain. That's right. All right. Now to the star of the show, which I have told you nothing about. Okay. Lithotomy. Which is? The removal of kidney stones. Oof. Now, I hope I'm pronouncing all this right. Maybe it's it lithotomy right. or something, but I'm going to go with lithotomy. Now, kidney stones terrified the hell out of me. Um, they run through my family. I know that. And so... All that soda drink. You know I'm constantly complaining and worrying about them, so I, I think this is uh, good for you to learn uh, more about my fear. And in case I need to perform any of these things on time. That's right. <laughs> you might. Okay, so... It might be bad now. We have pain medication and all this crap, but... It, in history, this this was like the this was the the mac daddy of them all. This was the worst crap you could go through. I bet it still is sort of. The earliest recorded lithotomy dates back to the ancient Egyptians. They had a very unique method for removal. They would dilate their urethra by shoving in with great force a tube made of cartilage or wood, which was as oh. thick as the thumb. Look oh. at your thumb and picture that tube at ramming speed. I assume you got to get Jeez up there somehow. Christ. Then they'd push from within the rectum to get the stone to come out, or put their mouth on the tube and try to suck it out. Ew! But then it, the best case scenario, you have a kidney stone in your mouth. Hey, you got to do what you got to do. They were hardcore in ancient I Egypt. I paid a lot. Jesus, and poor guy. Jesus, I don't know how you still have a penis left after that. They got two less hours having to build a pyramid. Yeah, I guess it's a break from that. Things don't get better as time goes on, and given what we know about the Middle Ages and anesthetic, stone removal was extremely painful. The first surgical operation was called the Lesser Operation, also called Apparatus Minor, because you only needed a knife 
and a hook. I thought you were going to say on a fork. <laughs> this was the staple for a long time. It was more or less the same operation from Greek and Roman times all the way to the Middle Ages. Okay, so, so how long is that, roughly? We're, oh boy, testing my knowledge <laughs> on Greek and Roman times. Here. Middle Ages will go up until about 1500, Greek and Roman times. Uh, let's just say 1500. Okay. Well, let's just say... so. Let's just say minimum a thousand. You got a thousand freaking years with nothing happening. Better hope you don't get a kidney stone. It's terrible. Here's how it would go. Okay. The patient would sit on the lap of a strong assistant that will restrain them with their legs bound to their neck or restrained by assistants, as you can see in this picture. There's another one with his neck bound. It's, it's crazy. Oh, my God. Um, the physician will stand before the patient and insert two fingers into the anus and then press with his other fingers over the patient's pubes. This is so violating. So you're, you're picturing this right now, right? Yeah. Well, he well, he dip his fingers in oil first. That is that is mentioned. Well, that's nice. So it's not a lot of friction getting up in there. Oh, you should also... Very intrusive. But like two days or three days before, you should also be like, you know, fasting, fasting right. high fiber diet. So the same kind of uh, rules as like for colonoscopy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Someone's got to be looking up there. They don't need any, any extra uh, company. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... He then feels for a hard pellet in the bladder using his, you know, two fingers, kind of sandwiching right. it. It found, if found, it will be moved towards the neck of the bladder. So they're pushing it down. And if they push with enough force, they can make it appear as a bulge in the perineum. Or as What's most, the perineum? As most people know, the gooch. Ah, right down there, eh? Or uh, the taint. So between... We got, a, we got a couple of those. Between the genitals and the anus. Yes. That's a terrible place. Okay. An incision will then be made into the bladder, and the stone can be removed. So you can see where the bulge is. You're kind of just doing a little... So they just pop it out. They just slice <sighs> it and pop it out. Pop it out. Oof. Like, literally... What with, if you have more than one? What literally, if... with a finger, they're sticking it into your bladder and popping it out. Yeah, that's gotta not feel... You gotta just be, like, unconscious from pain at that point, you know? So, well, no, no, they're not. They're not unconscious because the, the patients are usually freaking out at this point. Even with like a bunch of guys holding them down, he's probably moving like crazy. So yeah. accidental cuts to the rectum were like super common. <sighs> Jesus. And what did that cause? Hemorrhaging. Lots of hemorrhaging. <laughs> <laughs> they would lose a lot of blood. Um, you get but hemorrhaging. Th they wouldn't suture any of the wounds. They wouldn't close them up because of the 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 pus deal. They, right, you need the pus. For they deal. want to leave it open until they see pus. Then maybe they'll close the wounds. Okay. Yeah. So if they were hemorrhaging, they just throw them in a bath of vinegar and salt. Now, if you have got oh a God. gaping wound down there, do you want to go into a, a vat of vinegar and oh salt? Oh my God! You just yeah, pour lemon juice on it and maybe some rusty nails. Literally rubbing salt in the wounds. That's where that probably came from, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're finding more about history than we thought. Yeah. Okay. So in 18... I'm sorry. In 1520, as surgery advances, we get a new operation. The apparatus major, or greater operation, named because of the ten different tools used during it. Oh, ten. Not just the fingers. Now, I need to mention that things are getting... Things are going to get worse. They're not going to get better because, I mean, that seemed bad, but things are going to get worse. More painful. The patient would be placed in a special chair and bound at the wrists and ankles. I like that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a better start. That's comforting. The surgeon would start by entering a groove staff into the urethra Just... through which tools would be guided. So they're going, going right through the urethra. Any idea how big this this grooved staff is? Oh, I'll show, I'll show you pictures later. Okay. It's it's pretty not gnarly. Not small, I'd imagine. It's not, it's not good. Hey. It's better than the Egyptians, but it's it's not <laughs> far off. Okay, so once the staff is in place, so now you got something kind of poking poking on the, uh, the bladder. Poking up there. Coming through, you're like, oh, that's where it is. Okay, so now they're like, okay, let's you cut. A, see it through the skin. Let's cut two to four inches right through to the bladder. Jeez. Now, uh, I, it's probably French. A gor gorget. Gorget. <laughs> a, a, a gorget or a concave tool to facilitate forceps would then be added along with a dilator. Okay. Or a aperians. Aperians? Aperians. Oh. That's, pro that's probably closer to it. So, basically, it's... Uh, how to describe it? Think about, like, a car jack or something, you know? You know what? That's the same tool they use in... Um 
gynecology when they're giving you a pap smear. Yeah, they push yeah, exactly. It in and they crank it and it widens, right? Yeah. So, okay. it, so you, they, they it shove is. a car jack into this two to four inches and they just and they start making it bigger and bigger. Now this is going to tear like freaking everything there. The whole bladder is going to be torn. Everything's getting torn to shreds. Now, if the opening at this point was still too small, a large pair of forceps would be inserted. Now, they had to dilate it more for the forceps. A would they just, like, rip the penis apart? <laughs> it's just blown to smithereens at this point. A large pair of forceps would be inserted to crush the stone and then scoop it out. Mm. But the mortality rate on this was awfully high. I can imagine. You probably... Do you bleed to death or you just die of, like, shock or what's going on? You're going to bleed to death or get an infection and die. Yeah. Um, but this surgery is still in like a weird kind of area. And they kind of have to be held responsible for any kind of fault or death uh, made because of them. So they had liability back then. Sort of, yeah. So, <laughs> lithotomists adopted the motto, cut and run. So they just left them to their own devices after the procedure. No aftercare. Well, they were like, I gotta get the fuck out of town. Oh, you mean literally? Yeah, because I, if this guy dies, I gotta get out of here. Alright, I can kind of understand that, I suppose. And I think I think that might be the birth of Cut and Run, so now that's the, that's the third that's saying the third. we got. That's the third, yeah. Um, and the incision, once again, was not sutured. It was left open. So they literally just knife you in the bladder, pull out that damn... Su- Wait, no, I'm not thinking of the one before this. No, no, that's, that's it. Okay, so they, they jab a giant metal rod up your urethra. They stick a giant knife in your bladder, rip out the stone, and they're just like, all right, see you, bud. Man, your urine gets to just kind of drip into your your, your body. Jesus. I don't know how anybody <laughs> survived that. You're a fucking boss if you okay, survive Okay, but it. it gets better. Uh, So now... Worse. Now there's the lateral operation. Okay. This is a fun one. Okay, so this started about uh, the turn... Uh, the lateral operation came about at the start of the 18th century. Okay. So now we're now we're getting into the 1700s. Again, a staff was inserted into the urethra, but this time it pointed downward. So they're they're going through the bottom this time. So the the incisions made near the ischial tuberosity, which is like your your butt bone, mm-hmm. uh, it's cutting through all the tissues there. So you're just severing every muscle, everything holding things in place down well, there. Now you're severing through the prostate. And what problems does that cause? numerous but mainly an ability to hold your bladder there's a real big problem uh death yeah well yeah (laughs) i don't know some of the other problems sound worse Um, (laughs) (laughs) so they're cutting through all the tissue there until they hit their mark i don't know why this was an advancement but it was some guy's theory and he's he's running with it we'll get we'll get to him in a bit okay a finger would be shoved into the wound and once the stone was felt in went the dilator and the forceps and this apparently had an extremely high mortality. The pain experienced from pulling the stone back through the prostate was so intense, and the hemorrhaging from the trauma was so severe that mortality was even more common. Probably like 90% or more, right? It's not that bad. But it's how not do that bad. That? I mean, I'd rather go sit on the stone like that face guy, the hemorrhoid well, saint. Hold on, I'm, I'm going to give you the stats. I'm going to give you the stats. Okay. So the inventor, uh, Fure Jacques, who came up with this and he, he was real, really wanted to pioneer this. Okay. He performed this operation on 60 patients in a three month period. So he's just banging them out. He's just, he is just banging them out. Only 12 walked away cured. Wow, the original, like, <laughs> uh, what do you call it? The, the study, original, like, test study, right? What original test study? It's like the invention of that when you get like a group of people that all have the same problem. And you're like, all right, let's see if this works. No, he's not. He's he's just kind of like doing it to show like people are coming to watch him, and he's okay, just so doing he's it. Teaching. He's teaching. This he's is te- how you do a really shitty he's job. He's teaching this. Wait. So you said three people survived? Twelve. Twelve out of sixty survived. <laughs> Tw- okay. Twenty-five died afterwards. Like, right afterwards. Like, right afterwards. And I, 22 remained in the hospital beyond recovery. I, I just, this is a fucking kidney stone, okay? I just... This is a kidney stone. I know, like, is it so painful to have a kidney stone that you would risk this 
you know, well, I'm, this procedure. I'm about to get to that. Okay. See, living with kidney stones is incredibly painful, and your bladder can burst if it's obstructing the urine. Right, because nothing's getting through. In which case, you're going to die. So, you kind of have to risk it. But there's also not, like, a ton of lithotomists at the time. Okay. Okay? There, some are just traveling from city to city doing these terrible fucking procedures. Experiments. And, and you got to wait. Like, you just got to wait till the guy shows up in your town. You could die in the meantime. And you can die in the meantime. Okay. So, what did they do? What did they do? This is called the Cox Trocar. It was a curved catheter, as you can see here. That looks like a meat thermometer. And it had a sharp end. And they would jam it into the bladder, through the rectum underneath, or right through the prostate. And this just lets them, you know, get urine out of, the, out of their body. Empty it out. Um, while, it bursts. while they wait for the permanent solution. So you just keep uh, peeing through the little hole. It just It just goes out. Okay. You got, you got like a little cap on it, and then when you get a chance, you just kind of, and then it just flows out. Huh, like a colostomy bag. <laughs> yeah, like okay. a colostomy bag. Well, that's handy. Um, and again, of course, there's no anesthetic, so someone's just ramming this up your ass into your bladder. Mmm. This is the birth of BDSM. Now, things finally start getting better when uh, lithotripsy was invented in 1825. Here, a drilling instrument would be inserted through the urethra into the bladder. Within, it would retract a sheath to reveal three curved arms that would seize the stone, allowing an inner drill to break it apart. Oh my god. Again, no anesthetic, but as an alternative to surgery, it was the most preferable option. Wait, this isn't surgery? They're, I, well, they're, I guess, they're, they're not cutting anything they're not open. Cutting, but they're just jamming a giant rod up your uh, urethra. Up your urethra. Around. Hey, some people enjoy that. Yeah, I guess. So there's people out there. To each his own. To each his own. So what did you think? Did you, did you learn something new? Did you enjoy that? I learned a lot of things that I could do without the knowledge of because they sound <laughs> so horrendous. What was your favorite one? <laughs> oh, I mean, the blowing smoke up the ass is definitely pretty funny. I mean, there's just absolutely no benefit to that. At least for the other procedures, like, they're trying to help the guy out. They're probably going to die in pain anyways, but that was just like a goof. It was like, oh, this guy's dead. Let's blow some tobacco up his ass. <laughs> But, um... We should try that out. There's that There's that whole TLC th thing about uh, the coffee enemas. But that's we, different, though. We could get on there doing the tobacco enemas. Because, like, coffee enemas, I get that. Because you... It, it's it's part of your digestive tract that absorbs it, right? So you stick it up the ass, you get, you know, a little extra buzz, or maybe a little faster, sort of, like, snorting. That's how I take my alcohol. Right. You can do an alcohol tampon. But with, like, tobacco, you're supposed to smoke that. It's the lungs. It's not part of the digestive tract, right? right? Yeah, it, it, it gets in there. Maybe it does. I mean, there had to All be drugs some sort of high for a it. great wave. Or stimulating effect, there. other than just, my ass, you know, ow. How many things did we learn? We got the cut and run. I didn't I didn't even pick any of these up when I was when I was doing the research. The cut so and cut run. and run. Blowing smoke up your Blowing ass. Blowing smoke up your ass. There was one more. Um, what was it? I don't remember now. We'll have to go back through it, but. Lithotomy? Was something with lithotomies? Probably. Tonsils are the brain of the of, of the mouth of the throat. Tonsils are the brain of the throat. <laughs> that's, that's that's not that's a my saying. that's my favorite that's saying. My motto. Um, I've never had something jammed up your urethra, but I don't think it would be good. I think that's one of the highly known most painful things. Well, you are in luck. Kidney stones are more common in men. Thank God. And uh, they're way worse because apparently the female urethra is much shorter. So it's less Very suffering. less common, I think, too. But hey, you guys get to be spared uh, UTIs that are pretty frequent. This is true. Which I'm sure are less painful, but damn, are they frequent. Next time I'll be talking about how to put drugs up your anus. That's right. Talking and, and listening drugs? about and viewing about drugs up your anus. All right. Thank you. Bye.